We are live now, Doctor. Okay, thank you. So, uh, good evening, respected seniors, uh, colleagues, and all the wonderful and dynamic residents who have logged in today. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you yet again uh, now for the 12th master class of the online postgraduate teaching program, Kaksha. Kaksha is a PG teaching program uh, organized by ROS, Rajasthan Ophthalmological Society, which will cover all the major topics over a period of two years of the current uh, PG uh, curriculum. We'll be bringing the best of national and state faculty experts to share the knowledge and interact with you. The residents who have logged in and all other ophthalmologists who have logged in are also encouraged to put forward their doubts in a fearless manner and enter their queries either by raising their hands or entering in the chat box. Now coming to this class, uh, we have today with us my senior and a very dear friend, Dr. Mukesh Sharma from Center for Site Jaipur, who will be thread bearing a major an important topic for postgraduates and for every practicing ophthalmologist that is TOSIS, approach and management. Uh, Dr. Mukesh is an authority and a well-known figure amongst the oculoplasty circles, not just in India, but globally. Uh, a brief introduction of Dr. Mukesh, sir. Uh, he uh, is the medical director of Center for Site Jaipur and uh, he, was the form he was formerly associate professor department of ophthalmology, SMS Medical College, Jaipur. He has done his uh, post graduation uh, and a senior residency in oculoplasty and pediatric ophthalmology for the Apex Institute, RP Center, Ames, New Delhi. He has been uh, a faculty for uh, around 15 years in SMS Medical College, Jaipur, before leaving uh, the job to uh, pursue as medical director, CFS Jaipur. And uh, he has held uh, quite a few important administrative roles also. He is the incoming president of Jaipur Ophthalmological Society. He has uh, served as uh, a general secretary of uh, Oculoplasty Association of India two times. He has been the general secretary of Rajasthan Ophthalmological Society. He has uh, been the principal investigator ICMR for corneal epithelial stem cells and transplantation. And he has been editor general Rajasthan Ophthalmological Society and the chairman scientific committee. ROS. So all the important posts of the state and national societies has been held by him. He has numerous presentations and publications and has performed live surgeries at various forums across the country, winning best paper award, best of session award, and uh, uh, awarded the gold medal at IRRC in 2013. And he has won uh, the Delhi Ophthalmic Society annual conference quiz twice and won best video in OPL many times. <clears throat> I also welcome the ROS President Kilani sir, President-elect sir, Dr. Sanjeev Desai and our Dynamic Secretary from Jodhpur, Dr. Ghulam Ali for today's class. Uh, we as a tradition have two or three residents in the hot seat. This time we have Dr. Dashna. Dr. Dashna, are you here? Can you unmute yourself? And Daksh. Daksh, are you here? Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. And uh, they will, uh, dot, uh, we request Dr. Mukesh to interact with these residents as well as other residents freely and ask them questions in between. So that becomes, it becomes a more of an interactive session. Uh, these are all uh, final post, uh, final year postgraduates, SR and JRs from different colleges in Rajasthan and out of state. There will be a grand quiz uh, uh, with exciting prizes at the end of the Kaksha. So keep a strong vigil and listen carefully to win the quiz. Now I hand over the session to Dr. Mukesh sir and request him to start the class. Thank you Vishal for kind words. At the outset, I am thankful to Vishal Agrawal, Dr. Gulam Ali, Khilani sir and all other office bearers of ROS for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Kaksha has really set the ball rolling for PG teaching and it has become, it has formed a niche of the program. So uh, it's really indeed uh, a pleasure to be part of this pro program. So without wasting any more time, I'll be straight away going to the TOSIS. Uh, 
we will start with the basic and then gradually build up the presentation and towards the end of presentation we shall discuss about the management part of process also so whenever we talk about tosis we all know that tosis is drooping of upper eyelid and there is a term called as pseudotosis pseudotosis is, as the name itself gives you an idea it is apparent droop not the actual droop while true tosis is the actual droop so what is pseudotosis pseudotosis may occur in hypotropia hypotropia we all know when eyeball moves downward this is hypotropia and lid tend to follow the eyeball so in this particular patient eyeball has been moving moved downward and we are closing the other eyelid so eyeball has straightened up and tosis has disappeared so this is a case of pseudotosis once again you can have a look so apparently patient is having right eye tosis but as soon as we close the other eye and right eye takes up the fixation this tosis dis disappears so this is pseudotosis because of hypotrophia then there are other causes of pseudotosis also like blepharospasm there is no actual tosis but there is spasm of orbicularis oculi and it gives you an apparent condition of tosis herein you are having all the features of spasm lower eyelid is riding up upper eyelid is going down and also there is a feature of spasm in orbicularis in the central area also then there is a condition known as brow tosis this is seen in elder uh, in elderly population everything droops down all the soft tissue part uh, beginning from brow to the skin so actually it is not uh, lid tosis but brow tosis which is uh, causing uh, diminution of palpable fissure then there are certain other causes of pseudotosis there is either an apparent and large eyeball or uh, actual enlarged eyeball or there is an apparent enlarged eyeball so in contralateral uh, enlarged eyeball of other eyes uh, so in contralateral retraction this eye is having retraction so apparently it appears that right eye is getting smaller palpable fissure of right eye is getting smaller and patient is having right eye tosis but actually patient is having retraction of left eye similarly if there is proptosis of contralateral eye again it appears that right eye palpable fissure is narrow but actually in effect it is the left eye which is problematic similarly if there is ipsilateral small eye or apparently small eye like microphthalmos anophthalmos thysis bulbi these are actually small eye and patient is having an appearance of ptosis because lid tend to follow the eyeball or else if there is anophthalmos eyeball has moved inside because of fracture of floor of orbit generally then also there is an apparent appearance of ptosis so now we come to the actual ptosis or true ptosis whenever ptosis is classified there are two major group one is congenital 60% of all ptosis cases are congenital majority of them are congenital and 40% of them are acquired and out of all congenital ptosis 75% are unilateral and 25% are bilateral for acquired ptosis there are host of causes like neurogenic myogenic aponeurotic mechanical and traumatic uh, in congenital ptosis 90% of congenital ptosis are simple we call them simple when they uh, it is not associated with any other ocular abnormality but in 10% of the congenital ptosis they are known as they are uh, basically complicated congenital ptosis and they are associated with other ocular anomalies like associated weakness of elevator muscle like double elevator palsy like congenital synkinetic ptosis when there is marcus gun jaw winking phenomena along with ptosis and also there may be some syndrome like blepharophimosis syndrome wherein you have uh, blepharophimosis telecanthus and epicanthus along with uh, severe ptosis so these all cases they form uh, complicated ptosis and they are around 10% of all congenital ptosis so whenever we label a patient of ptosis you in exam also you are supposed to make the diagnosis of ptosis if you write diagnosis like this that patient is having ptosis in right eye 
examiner will not be very impressed. But if you write diagnosis like this, that patient is having right eye or OD congenital simple partial ptosis. So each word is self-explanatory. Congenital is congenital. Simple means not associated with any other problem. Uh, it is not complicated ptosis. And partial means there is some amount of palpable fissure which is open. Pal uh, ptosis is not severe enough to completely close the palpable fissure. So this is the complete diagnosis of ptosis and this is the way you should be writing and speaking about the diagnosis of ptosis in your exam. And if you speak like this, your examiner will automatically understand that this, this boy or girl is having metal and uh, we are dealing with somebody who is very intelligent. So now we come to the evaluation part of ptosis. In ptosis also, like in any other condition, we take certain pertinent point about history, like age, duration, these all point, they will suggest about the etiology of ptosis. As in my, uh, myasthenia gravis, we may have history of diplopia, dysphagia, etc. There may be association of lid movement with jaw movement, as in Marcus Gunn phenomena. Also, abnormal head posture may be there along. Uh, along with actual ptosis, we had some disturbance, I don't know. Then there may be one other important history, which is history of use of steroid eye drop. Generally, in post-cataract surgery, we do get cases of ptosis. There may be multiple causes for it. But one important cause nowadays is use of steroid eye drop, which is a causative factor in myogenic cases of ptosis. There may be other factors like uh, trauma to nerve because of superior rectus forceps, trauma to aponeurosis again because of superior rectus uh, suture applied. But seldom nowadays uh, we are applying superior rectus forceps uh, and superior rectus suture. Also, we do ask for previous photographs because sometimes patient says that ptosis has developed late, uh, later in the life patient's attendant also says, but when we ask for uh, photographs, then we uh, actually confirm that ptosis is congenital, it is not the acquired. So whenever we do a ptosis examination, we make a detailed ptosis chart. There are certain points in, these, uh, in this ptosis chart, all postgraduates and fellows should know about all these points. So it is not difficult to remember all these points. Uh, how to remember all these points? There are certain points which are uh, before the actual examination of ptosis. First, you are supposed to see patient from a distance. So you check for any head posture or face turn. Then you look for frontalis action, whether there is frown in the frontalis or not. Then you check for eyebrows position, whether there is actual brotosis or there is overaction of eyebrow. And also you look for eye, eyelid crease and lid fold. And also lid margin, whether, whether there is entropion, ectropion, or any other marginal abnormality, it is there or not. Then we go for palpable fissure. Palpable fissure can be directly measured by a rule, ruler or you can combine MRD1 with MRD2. We shall discuss these points a little later on. Then this will give you a, a vertical palpable fissure. Also, we need to measure the horizontal palpable fissure, especially in cases of blepharophimosis syndrome. Then we uh, check for amount of ptosis. So it can be calculated either by MRD1 method, we shall deal with it a little later on, or by palpable fissure method. Then we go for levator function. We check for lid lag if it is there or not. We check for leg ophthalmos. Also, then we see Bell's phenomena, which is a very, very important point because poor Bell's is generally a relative contraindication for ptosis surgery. Also, we check for Marcus Gunn phenomena, elif phenomena. Also, for extraocular movement, if there is any elevator palsy or not, corneal sensation, because corneal anesthesia again is a relative contraindication for ptosis surgery. We check for dry eye by doing Shermer test if it is possible. Also, we tend to check the pupil because it is meiotic in Horner syndrome and may, you may get mediatic pupil in third nerve palsy and vision. So now how to remember these points? 
initially there are five points before doing actual examination of ptosis and palpable fissure and these points are looking patient from a distance head posture then going from above to downward frontally section eyebrow position lid crease lid fold and lid margin then there are two points related to ptosis per se examination of palpable fissure and measurement of amount of ptosis then there are three l levator function lid lag legothelmos then there are three phenomena bells marcus gun elif then there are three ancillary signs not related directly to the ptosis extraocular movement corneal sensation and tremor and two points related to vision and pupil so how to mug them up five points before the actual ptosis examination two points related to amount of ptosis and palpable fissure Three L levator function, lid lag, leg of thalamus. Three phenomena: Bell's Marcus Gun lift. Three ancillary points: extraocular movement, sensation, tremor, and two points: vision and pupil. So this is how one can remember this ptosis chart with some practice. Even if you have become a proper clinician and you are uh, ready to operate or you are operating a patient of ptosis. in your busy opd also you should be checking at least these four points very carefully what are these four points amount of ptosis levator function bell's phenomena whether ptosis is simple or complicated complicated as i told you what are the uh, features which you get in complicated ptosis darshana or daksh so as i told you initially if you are there you can unmute yourself sir in complicated yeah, yeah. please carry on yeah. sir in complicated ptosis uh, there are uh, uh, features of uh, ptosis with other ocular uh, disorders like uh, it can be marcus gun jaw winking phenomena present or there can be uh, misdirection syndrome ocular misdirection syndrome mm uh -huh. good um, what else or there may be lepharophimosis lepharophimosis syndrome mm -hmm. there can be associated uh, elevator problems or movement problems yes And sir there may be associated syndrome like blepharophimosis syndrome so good so uh, this you need to check and also there is one mnemonic yes, bad sign in this bad b stand for bells poor A for corneal anesthesia and D for dry eye. So, if any of these three is present, this is a poor prognostic for ptosis surgery. So, bad sign for ptosis should also be noted. So, these are silent features which one must always check whether you are doing to uh, check uh, examining a case of ptosis in your busy OPD or not. These are mandatory points. now we shall discuss these four points in detail so amount of ptosis levator function bell's phenomena and whether it is simple or complicated one by one so how to check amount of ptosis it is checked by two methods one by mrd one method and other by measuring palpable fissure in primary gauge what is mrd one it is the distance between center of upper eyelid and the corneal light reflex and difference between two mrd between healthy and totic eye will give you amount of ptosis in bilateral cases the difference with standard what is the standard mrd1 standard mrd1 is around 4 to 5 mm so this will give you the amount of ptosis so uh, as i told you mrd1 is the distance between upper eyelid margin and corneal light reflex normally it is 4 to 4.5 if lid margin is above the light reflex which is there generally it is in positive value if ptosis is severe enough to cover the pupillary light reflex then mrd is in negative so you will have to lift the eyelid to see the light reflex so this will this amount of lifting which is required to see the light reflex is measured as minus mrd then mrd2 is distance between lower eyelid margin and corneal light reflex this is mrd2 and 
uh, if you combine MRD1 and MRD2, then you get the vertical palpable fissure. So in women, it is little more than the men, vertical palpable fissure. It is around 10 to 12 millimeter. In men, it is 9 to 10 millimeter because we all know that women, they have beautiful eyes. Upper eyelid normal position is 2 millimeter below the limbus and lower eyelid normal position is it just touches the limbus so you must know these eyelid position also because they are important in ptosis measurement how they are important we shall see it little later on so in congenital ptosis there are certain important points even if patient give you misleading history then also with examination you can really find out whether patient is having actually congenital ptosis or acquired ptosis so in congenital ptosis, levator muscle becomes fibrotic and it is neither able to contract properly nor able to relax properly. So if lid is not able to relax properly, then there is lid lag. What is lid lag? In down gauge, trotic eyelid is higher than the fellow eye. And this feature is classical of congenital ptosis. In acquired ptosis, you do not get lid lag. But one important point is that not all congenital ptosis cases have got lid lag. So it is there in up to 60% of congenital ptosis because in 40% of congenital ptosis, lid does not have uh, fibrotic tissue. Elevator does not have fibrotic tissue. So there is no lid lag. But if lid lag is there, then it is 100% that patient is having congenital ptosis. Also in congenital ptosis, uh, if ptosis is poor, then upper lid, upper lid crease may be absent or it is very poorly formed. While in acquired ptosis, generally you get lid crease. So how to check for uh, lid lag? This is for, uh, patient's appearance in primary gauge, up gauge, ptosis is increased and down gauge. Now you are seeing in down gauge, totic eye is having and large palpable fissure as compared to the normal eye. So this is lid lag. This denotes lid lag. Lid is lagging behind the eyeball and this is because of dystrophic or fibrotic levator muscle which is not able to relax properly. And how much is the lid lag? You measure this palpable fissure in down gauge in both the eyes and difference with normal eye is lid lag. Suppose in normal eye, in down gauge, palpable fissure is 5 mm and in totic eye, it is 8 mm. So lid lag is around 3 mm. So this is how one measures lid lag. So in this particular patient, there are certain measurements which, which were made. MRD1 in right eye, in primary, uh, primary gauge, it was 5 mm and left eye, it was 1 mm. So how much is the amount of ptosis here? by MRD, Daksh, right eye MRD is 5 mm, left eye MRD 1 is 1 mm. Yes. So how much is the amount of ptosis? Yes, sir, 4 mm. 4 mm, okay. Now we have also done the palpable fissure measurement in right eye, in primary gauge, palpable fissure is 10 mm, in left eye, it is 7 mm. So how much is the ptosis? So 3 mm. 3 mm. But ptosis cannot change depending on the mm. type of method you are using to examine. So ptosis should remain same. So why it has changed now in palpable fissure method? Anybody? Anybody can uh, type in the chat box also besides the hot seat resistance. They are all free so, to participate. So, so due to uh, fibrosis. So maybe due to fibrosis of the LPS muscle? No, but that fibrosis is creating this lid lag. Not in primary gauge it is uh, creating any measurement difference. In lid lag, of course, because of fibrosis, you are having lid lag. See, this 1 mm difference is because of lower lid sag. In left eye, as I told you, what is the normal position of lower eyelid? It should just touch the limbus. But in left eye, it is not touching the limbus. It is going one millimeter down. 
so because of this one limb, one millimeter lower lid sag or a retraction of lower lid by one millimeter you are getting an erroneous measurement of uh, uh, differential ptosis examination so one should always look for the actual lid position so this is very important and this one millimeter extra lower lid sag has given rise to extra one millimeter in palpable fissure and because of this you are thinking that ptosis is 3 mm but actually ptosis is 4 mm so whenever you have to take one method out of these two always go for mrd method rather than palpable fissure method i hope i am clear on this So, uh, ptosis is also graded. It is graded. Uh, there are three grades. Mild ptosis when ptosis is 2 millimeter, moderate when it is 3 millimeter, and severe ptosis when it is 4 millimeter or more. Then, how to check levator function? Levator function is checked uh, by this Burke's method. What you do is you ask patient to look down, you place your thumb against pro just to neutralize the frontally section, then place a ruler and measure the excursion of uh, upper eyelid on the ruler. You ask patient to look up and then the levator function is measured. Less than 4 millimeter is poor, 5 to 7 millimeter is fair, 8 to 12 millimeter is good and more than 12 millimeter is considered normal. So this is checking levator function is very important and it uh, guide us uh, in decision making whenever we are choosing a surgical option. So how it should be checked uh, practically? So you ask patient to look down, then place your thumb on the bro, neutralize the bro uh, frontally section, then ask patient to look up while place uh, checking the excursion of uh, lid on the ruler. So this is the way. Now we are checking levator function. So hardly there is 2 to 3 millimeter lid excursion is there. So the amount of levator function is 2 to 3 millimeter. Now incorrect way of doing it, your thumb should directly oppose on the bro. Your thumb should not pull the bro up or push the bro down. So while checking, uh, taking measurements, sometimes we are not very careful. Now we are pulling the bro up and we are erroneously imparting some amount of levator function. Now we are pushing the bro down and we are unnecessarily making levator function a little bit more poorer. So while checking levator function, your thumb should directly be opposing the eyebrow. It should not be pulling it up or it should not be pushing it down. Then the MRD3, what is MRD3? Distance between corneal light reflex and center of upper light margin in extreme up gauge. And also MLD, what is MLD? Margin limbal distance, it denotes levator function. So it is distance between center of upper lid margin to six o'clock limbus. Normally it is nine mm. Now, as I told you initially, we need to check Bell's phenomena very carefully because poor Bell's is a relative contraindication for ptosis surgery. So either we do not do surgery or we do uh, little under correction, uh, planned or intentional under correction while correcting ptosis with silicon rod because silicon rod gives you least lid lag and leg of thalmo. So it is cornea friendly. So how to check it and how to grade Bell's phenomena? It is called good bells when more than two-thirds of cornea disappears behind the upper eyelid on attempted closure. You just lift the eyelid till limbus and ask patient to close the eyelid. And if two-thirds or more than that cornea disappears, it is good bells. If it is one-third to two-third cornea disappears, then it is fair bells. And less than one-third of cornea disappears, then it is poor bells. Then again, there are certain types of bells, normal bells when cornea rolls up and out, inverse bells when cornea rolls up and in, reverse bells when cornea rolls down, and perverse bells 
it goes in bizarre direction. Sometimes when you check bells, it is going up. Other times when you check bells, it is going down. So it is because of innervational problem. So it is called as perverse pairs. So how to check it? You have lifted lid till limbus and ask patient to close. On attempted closer, cornea is moving up. So it is good bells. It is more than two third of cornea is getting disappeared under the upper eyelid. Now you have to check whether ptosis is complicated or simple. So as I told you, there are three major causes of complicated ptosis. Marcus gun or uh, synkinetic ptosis. Ptosis associated with the uh, weakness of elevator muscles, superior rectus or double elevator palsy and blepharophimosis syndrome. Now why ptosis get associated uh, with weakness of elevator palsy? It is because of a uh, few points. One, that levator and superior rectus muscle, they develop from same myotome. Developmentally, myotome is same. So there may be problems, weakness of both levator and superior rectus in a given patient. Also, levator and superior rectus, both are supplied by superior division of third nerve. So nerve supply is also the same. So that's why you may have associated weakness of elevator along with ptosis. Now in synkinetic ptosis, there are two major group, external pterygoid type synkinesis and internal pterygoid type synkinesis. Uh, I understand I am going a little bit more uh, theoretical or technical, whatever we can say, but I believe for PG and fellows, this is important to know all the intricacies of ptosis, even at the cost of uh, being a little bit more boring. I am trying to cover up all the important aspect of ptosis. So external pterygoid uh, synkinesis is that whenever you ask patient to move the jaw, eyelid raises on jaw thrust to opposite side. Or Whenever jaw is projected uh, forward, eyelid opens up. So when eyelid raises on jaw thrust to opposite side, it is because of ipsilateral external pterygoid synkinesis. And whenever lid is getting opened up on jaw projection forward, it is because of bilateral external pterygoid synkinesis. Then internal pterygoid synkinesis, eyelid raises upon teeth clinching. Generally, you get external pterygoid levator synkinesis uh, rather than internal levator, internal uh, pterygoid synkinesis. So this is the external levator synkinesis. Patient is opening the jaw and lid is getting lifted. So this is because of bilateral external pterygoid. Here, Lid is getting opened up on clinching the mouth. So this is internal pterygoid type of synkinesis. Then there is other term which is known as phenomena of merit amen. This is inverse Marcus gun phenomenon in some of the MCQ examination. So here movement of jaw creates Ptosis rather than retraction. Generally, in Marcus Gun phenomena, whenever patient moves jaw, there is opening up of eyelid. But here, eyelid is going down on mouth opening. So this is known as inverse Marcus Gun or phenomena of merit amen. So what is the surgery of choice for Marcus Gun uh, ptosis? V2 bilateral levator excision with sling. So you have to literally excise or throw away the aponeurosis of levator and then pass a sling to lift the lid. Because unless and until you remove the part of aponeurosis, then only the Marcus gun phenomena will be abolished. Because any attachment of aponeurosis onto the tarsus plate will create some amount of Marcus gun even after doing ptosis surgery. So this is the procedure of choice for Marcus gun ptosis. In many of the cases, you have association of both double elevator palsy along with Marcus gun ptosis. 
you are having Marcus Gun phenomena, eyelid is getting opened up. And also, this eyeball is not moving up. Patient is looking up, but this eyeball is not going up. So, there is associated elevator palsy also. So, both the uh, problems are there in a single patient. Then there is one another uh, etiology, blepharophimosis syndrome on corn, uh, corn romano syndrome. So, uh, here, I'm sorry. There is a tetrad tosis along with narrowing of horizontal palpable fissure, which is known as blepharophimosis, along with telecanthus. These two medial canthal are spaced widely. So this is telecanthus along with epicanthus inverses. There is a fold of skin from lower eyelid to upper eyelid. This is known as epicanthus inverses. If there is a skin fold from upper eyelid to downward, then this is epicanthus and lower eyelid upward, then this is epicanthus inverses. Then there may be other minor features like ectropion of literal part and entropion of medial part of lower eyelid. So this is one condition where in one eyelid, in lower eyelid, you have got both. Later laugh is having atropion and medial laugh is having entropion. So this is one very important part of uh, Marcus uh, blepharophimosis syndrome. There are certain specific points uh, with regard to blepharophimosis syndrome. You need to measure horizontal palpable fissure also because there is narrowing of this. You need to check intercanthal distance, distance between two canthi, medial canthus, and you need to check intercupillary distance. So normally the ratio between IPD and intercanthal distance, it should be more than two. What do you understand by more than two? In a normal person, suppose IPD is 50 millimeter, then intercanthal distance would be less than 25. It would be 22, 23, 21, something like that. So it means patient is not having telecanthus. In telecanthus patient, this ICD is increased. So ratio is less than two. So if IPD is 50 millimeter, intercanthal distance would be 26, 28, 27. So the ratio would be less than two. So, if it is less than 2, then you label patient as having telecanthus. Now, telecanthus also, though it is not part of ptosis, actually we may have got uh, various offshoot whenever we are uh, doing examination. But just to enumerate here, telecanthus can be of two types. Primary telecanthus, which is soft tissue variety, which is there in blepharophimosis syndrome. And secondary telecanthus is because of bony abnormality, which is uh, known as hypertelorism. Both these orbits are spaced uh, quite away from each other. So this is known as hypertelorism. And telecanthus due to hypertelorism is labeled as secondary telecanthus. So this is one patient with pretty long follow-up. 15 year post operative follow up after surgery in a uh, blepharophimosis syndrome. Now, there are acquired ptosis causes neurogenic, myogenic, aponeurotic, mechanical, and traumatic. In neurogenic, the important causes may be third nerve palsy and Horner syndrome. Then there may be uh, migraines, cerebral ptosis, or multiple sclerosis. These are also causes of neurogenic ptosis. This is third nerve palsy. Very obvious uh, to diagnose ptosis with exodeviation because of uh, unopposed lateral rectus action. So this is third nerve palsy patient. And all other movements are restricted because third nerve supplies all other muscles except lateral rectus and superior oblique. Horner syndrome, there are certain important findings. There is mild ptosis along with meiosis. You can see this pupil is smaller. It is difficult to appreciate in this particular photograph, but this pupil is smaller than the normal pupil. Also, there may be decreased iris pigmentation in long-standing cases with facial anhydrosis. In, in Horner syndrome, 
because there is basic pathology in first sympathetic ganglion and nerve supply of first sympathetic ganglion goes to Muller's muscle. Muller's muscle only impart 2 mm of lid lift. So that's why in Horner syndrome, ptosis is always mild because basic pathology is there in Muller's muscle, not in levator muscle. And even if the Muller's muscle is completely paralytic, ptosis cannot be more than 2 mm because this is the amount of lead lift which Muller's can give. So in all Marcus Gunn phenomena test, uh, cases, we do phenylephrin test test. Also, it is done in all cases of mild ptosis. We instill phenylephrine drop 2.5 to 10 percent. Uh, various authors have described differently. A rise of 1 to 1.5 millimeter is positive test because it indicates that Muller's muscle is viable and if you perform surgery on Muller's muscle, like MMCR, modified Muller's conjunctival resection, then this surgery will be successful. If there is paralysis of Muller's, it is not functional, then whatever you do on Muller's, there will not be any effect and you will have to go for other surgical modalities. So in Horner syndrome, in most of the cases, there is Muller's paralysis and you cannot do MMCR. Here, the procedure of choice is Fasanella servet resection. We shall discuss this particular surgery a little later on. Then the myogenic ptosis causes. Classical cause is myasthenia gravis. There may be certain myotonic uh, muscular dystrophy cases like myotonic dystrophy. Other uh, dystrophies like chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, abbreviated as CPEO. Then other pharyngeal ocular muscle dystrophy. Other causes of myogenic ptosis may be trauma to elevator muscle. One very important cause is contact lens wearer and also other important causes, mascara use and steroid drop. So this is one important uh, myogenic ptosis which is seen after cataract surgery. A uh, very famous case of this was in Atal Bihari Vajpayee ji's uh, eyelid. He had developed ptosis after cataract surgery and the most likely cause was this use of steroid hydro. So, uh, in myasthenia gravis, ptosis is frequently asymmetric and it may be unilateral. This is opposite of CPEO, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, which is a fairly symmetric condition, ptosis in both high is almost symmetrical and it is generally bilateral. In myasthenia gravis, characteristically, it has got diurnal variation. Ptosis is more during evening time and it is worsened with prolonged upgauge. It is known as fatigable ptosis. Also, there may be Coggan's lit twitch sign. So, I'll not go into uh, theoretical detail of this. But one very important uh, sign is ice pack sign. And it can be done in your OPD. You need not to do any laboratory test like RNS test or ACH, ACH receptor antibody assay, etc. You just apply ice pack over the eyes and ptosis improves. You can see in this particular patient, ptosis is, it has got significantly improved. This is ptosis before applying ice pack and you can see after applying ice pack, ptosis has improved. So this is a very important clinical test to adjudge whether patient is having myasthenia or not. Then there are other tests also like atrophonium test. It is not available. It is trade name of atrophonium is tensilon. So we all talk about tensilon test. You inject tensilon and you check for ptosis after two to five minutes and there is immediate elevation. What we do is neostigmine test. Here, neostigmine should be given always IM. I have seen people giving neostigmine also IV and patient getting landed up in all the major problems. Um, so neostigmine should always be given IM, not IV. 
So if you give it IV, then there will be twitching of eyelid, respiratory problems, and major, major side effects. And it should be checked after 15 to 30 minutes because if you inject neostigmant IM, then the effect come only after 15 to 30 minutes. Maximum dose which is which can be given is 1.5 milligram. There may be certain side effect. These all are mascarinic side effects. So one should be careful enough and check for pulse rate. One should always be ready with atropine. Sometime atropine is given before injecting the new stigma or tensilon. This is CPO. As I told you, patient is having bilateral symmetric ptosis. This is primary gauge appearance. Ptosis bilateral, almost symmetric. Patient is having movement restriction also. Patient is looking up. Eyeballs are not moving down. Looking down, some amount of movement is there. Patient is looking towards the right side. Again, movement is restricted and also towards left side. So there are various types. It may be isolated. It may be associated with other dystrophies also. One important syndrome is Kern-Sire syndrome where you have got association. It is a triad of RP-like pigmentary retinopathy along with CPEO, along with conductive heart defects. So this is known as Kern-Sire syndrome. Again, an important uh, syndrome for your MCQ examination. As this condition is symmetrical, generally there is no diplopia. This is how it is differentiated from myasthenia gravis. So, uh, uh, now we are discussing about the aponeurotic ptosis. There are various causes for aponeurotic ptosis. In congenital ptosis also, there may be aponeurotic defect. Then in senile ptosis, which is classical aponeurotic ptosis, also in post-operatives, if you uh, apply your levator muscle, then you may damage aponeurosis, blephrochalysis, along with ptosis or trauma, which may create aponeurotic ptosis. Classic point of aponeurosis ptosis is that there is high lid crease, good levator function, high or absent lid crease. And also cornea may shine through the upper eyelid. You can see this black is corneal reflex, which is visible through even through the skin because of dehesed levator aponeurosis. Then the mechanical ptosis because of excessive weight on upper eyelid due to tumor, multiple collagen, etc. This is a case of neurofibromatosis. Traumatic ptosis is a Pandora's box. There may be various mechanisms, cicatrice cicatrization, aponeurotic defect, neurogenic ptosis. So each case of trauma is unique and you will have to um, examine different, every case as a unique case. Now we come to the ptosis management part, guideline and the decision making. So decision making in congenital ptosis, what should be the ideal age for surgery in congenital ptosis? Four to five years of age. Why surgery is performed at this time? Because this is the time when you can examine patient properly. You can check for a, a levator function also, lid leg, leg of thalmos, and also anatomically levator mus muscle becomes a kind of mature muscle and the results are good. But ptosis is operated early if there are chances of amblyopia. If ptosis is covering pupil, then you will have to operate ptosis as early as three months of age also. Also, it is important to refract under cycloplegia all cases of ptosis because there are associations of anisometropia along with ptosis. So you'll have to correct anisometropia also. Do not restrict your examination to lid per se. Surgical aim, you tend to do mild undercorrection if patient is having good levator action because in post-operative period, levator big will become a little bit more stronger. And you tend to overcorrect a little bit if there is poor levator 
action because in poor levator action, lid will tend to droop down with time. So this is basic aim. Poor levator function, you tend to overcorrect. Good levator action patient, you tend to undercorrect. In acquired ptosis, basic principle is that you will have to always wait for six months of stable ptosis period before any inciting factor. Say trauma, if it is there, you have to wait for six months at least before doing surgery. And you aim for generally mild undercorrection because these patients sometimes uh, they behave in a bizarre manner and it is always better to leave little bit undercorrected lid rather than overcorrected lid and chance for corneal exposure. So, in mild doses, as I told you earlier also, we do phenylephrine test. If it is positive, it means Muller's muscle is functional. And this particular surgery, Muller's muscle congenital resection, it is done. This is a wonderful surgery, very easy surgery, and it gives very good effect. If it is negative, then either the Fasanella servet resection is done or levator resection is done. And classically in in uh, my, uh, in Horner syndrome uh, cases, you got you get uh, Muller's muscle paralysis. So generally, MMCR is not successful, and FS resection needs to be done. If ptosis is moderate, then procedure of choice is levator surgery, either resection or plication. If ptosis is severe and it is bilateral, then we always go for frontalis sling, either silicone or facial lata. If ptosis is severe and it is unilateral, then also sling is a very important surgical modality and it gives almost short, short correction. Short of that, we can do frontalis flap also and levator resection also if there is some amount of levator function which is there. Now, Fasanella Servet Index uh, Surgery, as I told you, classical indication is Horner syndrome, mild ptosis with good levator function. A very simple surgery. We just cut tarsus plate along with conjunctiva. And every two millimeter of tarsus resection correct one millimeter of ptosis. So maximum permissible limit of tarsus resection is four millimeter because in normal Indian population, tarsus length is around eight millimeter only, tarsus height. In West, it is up to 10 millimeter. So you need at least four mm of intact tarsus for imparting strength on upper eyelid. So that's why you can resect only up to four millimeter of tarsus so that's why you can only correct up to 2 mm of ptosis by, uh, by this Fasanella Servet resection. So this is a patient of mild ptosis left eye. And uh, I'm just briefly running through this surgery. So we have passed stay sutures, we have marked this four millimeter part on the tarsus plate. Either you can pass fine mosquito uh, forceps here, or you can pass lid sutures. This cautery is being applied just to give a permanent marking and reduce the bleeding. So instead of clamp mosquito forceps, we are just passing this holding suture. So three set of these sutures are placed so that your post uh, resection suturing can be done with ease. Then this four millimeter part is resected either by scissor or by cutting diathermy, radio frequency cautery, which we are using. And because of your these uh, stay sutures, your these two cut margins are close to each other and you can suture them uh, either with 80 Y-quill or with plain cat gut. You should not be using hard sutures because you may have corneal exposure inside. So this completes your surgery, very simple surgery. And this is the post-op result. So fairly symmetrical results. Then MMCR, this is Muller's muscle conjunctival resection. It is a kind of uh, fascinella servet only, but 
the differentiating point is instead of tarsus plate, we are resecting conjunctiva along with Muller's muscle. We are grasping conjunctiva and Muller's muscle with the clamp and we are resecting it. This is post operative result. So, before doing MMCR, you must always check for Muller's muscle function by instilling which drop? Which drop? Darshana? Phenylephrine so, drop. Good. Because unless and until your Muller's muscle is functional, the surgery result will not uh, come. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So how it is done? You pass again a stay suture in upper eyelid, evert the lid. Generally here we do around four millimeter of. 3.5 to 4 millimeter of uh, conjunctival Muller's resection per mm of ptosis. So here we are marking it. Ptosis was somewhere around 3 millimeter. So we have marked this around 5 millimeter. And because it will be double breasted, so effectively we shall be resecting 10 mm of tissue. We have passed sutures. And then this Muller's clamp, we have grasped this tissue. Ahead of Muller's clamp, we are uh, making marks with Gautry just to reduce the bleeding. Then we shall pass a running suture. We are using here 6 So we are passing this suture in front of your clamp. So this running suture has been passed in entire length of lid and then imme uh, immediately beneath the clamp, this tissue is cut with the help of BP handle knife by metal to metal contact. What do you mean by metal to metal contact? You are just cutting in close contact with clamp so that inadvertently you should not cut these sutures. So you have cut the clamped amount of tissue, which is around 10 millimeter. And then you pull your suture. So this is the amount of tissue which has been resected. And as it is double breasted, it is opened up and measured. And then these two cut end of, these two sutures end are taken on the skin side. And just a knot has been applied. After eight days or so, this suture will be cut from this side and then it will be pulled up. So the suture will come out and in its entirety and there will not be any scar on the skin. So levator resection, it is a preferred technique in most unilateral cases, except where there is nil levator action. Amount of resection, either there is... Uh, it is done uh, based on some preoperative nomograms or based on the OT finding. Generally, we go uh, with OT finding. OT finding means we, we leave the lid either at limbus or 2 millimeter below the limbus in those cases where there is good levator function or 1 millimeter above the limbus in those cases where there is poor levator function. Horns two horns of levator, they are cut extensively if there is severe ptosis with poor levator function is there. And one very important aspect is Vitnal's ligament. It is, a, it is the most important landmark in levator resection surgery. And this ligament is there at the junction of levator aponeurosis with muscular part of levator. So length of levator aponeurosis is variable. 15 to 30 millimeter in different individuals. Minimal levator amount of levator aponeurosis which needs to be resected for any correction is 12 millimeter. So if you do levator resection less than 12 millimeter, there will not be any impact. And maximum limit of levator resection is close to vitnal ligament because beyond that there is no aponeurosis. There will be muscular part of levator and you cannot resect the muscular part. 
So appropriate length of aponeurosis resected would be between 12 mm to Wittnau's ligament. And there are certain fixed formulae like Potterman's formula, but they are less favored. We generally go with the OT table assessment. Generally, we make patient sit because this surgery is done under local anesthesia and we check for uh, upper lid uh, level in sitting position. So if levator action is two to four millimeter, means poor, then we we'll leave your, uh, our lid one millimeter above the limbus, that is we overcorrect. If it is fair, we leave lid at limbus on one millimeter below the limbus. And if the levator function is quite good, then we leave lid at two millimeter below the limbus. So this is important. Margin limbal distance, it denote your levator function and different in MLD of two side in unilateral cases or difference with normal in bilateral cases multiplied by three. This gives, uh, this will give you the amount of levator resection which is required in a given case. This is Putaman's formula, but we do not go with this fixed formula. We go with uh, according to the OT table assessment. So this is post-operative result in some of the cases. So uh, this is how levator resection is done. Lid crease is marked. Three stay sutures are applied. Lid is incised. And here we are cutting the orbital septum. Underneath the septum, there is fat. And underneath the fat, there is levator aponeurosis. So this is the aponeurotic part. Again, we have applied three stay suture in the aponeurosis and it is uh, being disinserted from the tarsus plate. So this color change, this is a little bit more pinkish white than the rest of the tissue, which is reddish. We are cutting the horn. Now the lateral horn and uh, your lacrimal gland is there in close proximation. This is palpable part of lacrimal gland. We should not be damaging this. And this is the, this is lacrimal gland. And this white part is Wittnall's ligament. So it is just a condensation. So this is the maximum limit of levator which can be dissected. So this resection is done as per the individual case and we check for correction on table also. So this is how levator resection is done. Now about the last surgery, which is frontalis sling. So indications, classical indication is bilateral severe ptosis. Then the other indication may be unilateral severe ptosis with poor levator function. Material use may be autologous or artificial. Classical autologous material is facial atta. You may use pomalaris, longus tendon or skin strips, etc. But generally, in all, all autologous material, only the facial atta is used. Sometimes we use temporalis fascia also. In artificial material, best material is silicon rod. Previously, we had used non-absorbable sutures like proline, ethibond, etc. But nowadays, with the easy availability of silicon, everybody is using silicon rod. Certain advantages of silicon rod, it is a potentially reversible condition uh, technique. You can easily remove or loosen silicon rod. So it is a procedure of choice for infant because sometimes you need to overcorrect or uh, do tightening up in post-operative period or loosening up in patient with poor bells. So it is a procedure of choice in these two conditions. It has got least lid lag and lag of thalmos of all the uh, process surgery. It is a very readily available material, very short surgery and almost equal efficacy as compared to facial ATA. Complication profile is also fairly acceptable and it is extremely easy to perform under local anesthesia. Facial ATA needs to be done under general anesthesia. But for facial atta, 
it is very strong yet supple material more physiological than the silicon rod it is coarse in tight lead and it virtually eliminate problems of silicon like extrusion foreign body granuloma infection slippage etc so here you are seeing extrusion in a case of silicon rod this has extruded out here and your granuloma is formed so these problems are there in silicon rod in rare cases say around 5 to 10 percent of cases but they are there in facial ata you get once you you have done it you will not have any of these problems so dictum is do it and forget it so how these slings are passed either by fox's pentagon method you pass them in pentagon way two stab incision on either side of uh, cornea two stab incision above the brow and one center incision this is fox's pentagon also one can do crawford's double triangle three stab incision on uh, lid margin 3 to 4 mm away and two incisions above brow and one central incision so in this you require two strip of sling material per eye while in pentagon you require only one strip of sling material per eye so generally we all nowadays using pentagon method so for silicon sling certain pearl is you should not be reuse it you can titrate tightening and end point should be at upper uh, at limbus and one should always make a long tunnel and leave cut end of silicon deep inside the tunnel to avoid extrusion we shall see it little later on sometime we do skin muscle excision in silicon sling also to avoid excessive lid fold i think these are very technical points so we will avoid discussing them so how silicon rod is done this is a very young patient and embryogenic ptosis so we are performing surgery at around 1 year of age so two step incision would be made on either side of limbus two above brow and one central incision so they are marked you can make this step incision by knife or by your diathermy then is central incision you make a long tunnel and you bury your cut end of silicon inside this tunnel so they do not extrude out so this is the silicon rod which is commercially available there is a sleeve which is being provided by the company nowadays oro lab make very cheap and very good silicon rod so you can cut this sleeve in two part also in one eye generally you require half of the sleeve you can bend these malleable needles according to as per your requirement and as per the curve of upper eyelid and just pass these needles your silicon rod is threaded onto the needle so pass them as pentagon and finally once you are through then you will pass these two end of silicon through the sleeve so that post operatively it does not retract back and then you can apply secure it by passing one or two more knots though it is not mandatory then we tighten these two end with the help of a non absorbable suture and we cut the suture and then we cut the excessive amount of silicon and these two long ends are buried deep inside the tunnel which we have made so that there will not be any post operative extrusion and then it is sutured in two layers here so so this is the pre operative condition and post operative so you can see very good correction post operatively these are uh, certain other photographs of silicon uh, rod operated patients these are photographs of facial ata 
facial ATA is considered as gold standard for all sling and all other procedures are compared with facial ATA. So facial ATA, for facial ATA retrieval, you need to make a thigh incision. With practice, you can make a very small thigh incision, around one inch incision, and you can retrieve around 10 centimeter of facial ATA, which is the normal length of facial ATA, which is required for doing your sling. So uh, this is how it is retrieved. You just uh, expose the facial ATA in lateral part of thigh, make two vertical cut and just enlarge these incision with the help of long surgical scissors. Then pass your scissor a little bit bluntly and just cut the one end. And follow the same thing from the other part, upper end of uh, your incision. So this we would retrieve around 14 centimeter of facial ATA. You require only 10 centimeter. Then you can make tiny strips, two to three millimeter strip. Those strips are passed in the lid in pentagon manner as the silicon rod were passed with the help of right stosis needle. This is the right stosis needle. And our surgery is done. For Marcus gun ptosis, if Marcus gun is significant, then you have to do bilateral levator excision with sling. It will give you best result. You can do unilateral levator excision with sling, but there will be discrepancy in up gauge and down gauge. If Marcus gun is insignificant, then you can um, leave the Marcus gun and you can only do the levator surgery. But in that scenario, Marcus gun will not be abolished it will be there. But in mild uh, Marcus gun phenomena cases, patient is not worried for Marcus gun. He or she is worried for ptosis only. In those cases, you can do levator uh, resection. But in these cases, you must caution patient that this Marcus gun may increase a little bit in post-op period because you are strengthening the levator. So this is preoperative patient. You can see Marcus gun phenomena and here bilateral levator excision has been done. You can see there is no lid uh, movement or very little lid, lid movement is there on jaw movement. So Marcus gun has gone and lid has also lifted. Similarly, yet another patient. Marcus gun phenomena after surgery, no Marcus gun phenomena. So aponeurotic ptosis, you have to identify the defect, defect and plicate the aponeurosis. So I don't think we should be going into this surgery detail. We target mild undercorrection in these aponeurotic ptosis as it is there in this particular case because sometimes these lid may lift with time. So to conclude, for any given case of ptosis, a thorough evaluation is mandatory. It is key to proper management and a tailored approach is needed for every case according to the suitability of patient. Of course, we must always explain realistic result and side effect to all patients. So thank you for your patience hearing. If there are any questions, we may take them up now. And then there are few MCQs. I, I think we can take up MCQs after the questions. So, so we have a few uh, questions in the chat box. One is how long after sling surgery can one reoperate in case of under correction? Okay, sir. Mm, I can't find any question in chat. In box. the chat box, sir. Uh, I'll just I'll just uh, speak to you. 
I am so, able to access. So is the there question, any question? Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? All right. So I feel everybody is sleepy. No, no, sir. Can you hear me? <laughs> so uh, I sir, think we should go for uh, MCQs. Vishal. Sir, can you hear me? Hmm? Can you hear me? Yeah, now. Sir, can you hear me now? Yes. Sir, there is a question in the chat box. Okay. How long after sling surgery can one reoperate in case of undercorrection? Please, sling surgery re, uh, reoperation. If you have done silicone sling, then as soon as your lid edema has recovered, maybe after two weeks only, if there is under correction, then it is unlikely that that under correction will go away. So better to do tightening immediately when lid edema has gone up. So ideal time is around two weeks or so, so that there is no adhesion also and you can do tightening very easily. Okay. And uh, one question is from Asma Parveen. How can mascara cause ptosis that you mentioned in the initial slides? Correct. So the etiology is not very well known, but some chemical which is there in the mascara may cause some changes in the muscle function. And uh, this has been noticed uh, in few of the ladies who were using mascara very regularly and they had developed ptosis. So it is being indicated as one of the agents which can create some pathological changes in the muscle, levator muscle, and which can cause ptosis. But the mechanism itself is not very clear. But it is one of the causes of myogenic ptosis. So it is said to cause some changes in levator muscle function. Okay. okay. So now, sir, we are moving to the quiz section. So I gather that you have two questions for the residents. All right. And how much time will you uh, allow them to, uh, you know, uh, type in the option? 10 seconds will be enough? The oh, difficulty yes. level? Yeah, okay. yeah, 10 seconds would be enough. So, sir, will display the slide. There will be questions and you have to, uh, you know, just write the option. 1, 2, 3, 4 or A, B, C, D in the chat box. And whoever writes first will be the winner. Sir. All right. So, the question is for Marcus Gunn Doses, the treatment of choice is one levator resection. Second option is frontal sling. Third is levator resection along with frontal sling. And fourth is none of the above. Okay. I think every, everybody has got it right because this was uh, one of the last slides you showed, uh, the Marcus gun treatment. And yes. most of them have uh, you know answered it correctly. Option three. No, Vishal. Okay. That's, that's not the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> As per my knowledge, I am a little rusty in plastic. I thought resection and sling combined is that treatment of choice. Uh, not really. Ayushi Verma Oh, yeah, she has. So I'll ask her. What Ayushi, are you there? there? Can you put your mic on? Yes, sir, I'm there. Yes, Hello, Ayushi. Me. So, what is the uh, correct uh, procedure? Sir, it's bilateral levator excision rather than resection because that perfect. will aggravate. Perfect. perfect. So, perfect. it is excision, not resection. In resection, what is done is that some part of aponeurosis is resected and the remaining part of aponeurosis is sutured back to the tarsus plate. While in excision, you remove complete aponeurosis, you suture nothing to the tarsus plate. So in Marcus Gantosis, it is the excision along with frontalis sling. So there was some catch. Okay. Yeah, there was Are a you... catch and Ayushi caught that and she yeah. was only one to catch that. Okay, sir. The second question. Correct. So Horner syndrome, treatment of choice, conjunctivo molarectomy, fasanella servet resection, 
and levator resection and frontal sling. So any taker? Corner syndrome treatment of choice, one, two, three, four. Conjunctiva molarectomy, fascinella servet, levator resection, and frontal sling. Now the point is that in chat box now the previous uh, I think options are there. So Sir, it is after the excision. Ayushi typed excision. After that, the second question answers are there. Okay, okay. So, so you can proceed with the answer and then I'll tell you the winner. Okay. So the answer is two, Fasanella Servet resection. Because in Horner syndrome, ptosis is mild, two millimeter only. And in many of the cases, uh, Muller's muscle is not functional. So Mullerectomy or Muller's resection is not effective. So Fasanella Servet is considered as procedure of choice. So I think- uh, Avita Ganolia will get this. Yeah, I uh, think prize. She also she three, four, already five, gone the first. Kavita, yeah. are you there? Which uh, yes, sir. place are you from? Yes, sir. Kavita, which college are you from? Uh, sir, SMS Jaipur. SMS Jaipur. Okay, Kavita, congratulations. Your prize will be there at your workplace very soon. All right. So we Thank can you, have one more question. Sure, sure, sir. Sure. You can have a third question also. Yes. So for levator aponeurosis, most important landmark is this is the easiest of the lot. Horner's ligament, Wittnall's ligament, Putterman's ligament, and Crawford's ligament. Now, how to determine options for this particular of question so most of them have mentioned number two that is written yeah so i think uh, we do not give any prize for this we just <laughs> give a pat, pat on the back of everyone on the back okay. <laughs> a little encouragement because this was a very simple question correct 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 so i think uh, with this we complete our uh, uh kaksha or presentation on tosis Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, sir, this has been a wonderful class on TOSIS. It's workup and management. It's a vast topic and impossible to cover everything, but still a very well explained and a comprehensive uh, presentation along with excellent videos also, surgical videos. Thank you all the residents, ROS executive, teachers, and especially Mukesh sir, for the excellent teaching. We look forward uh, to the next class in the coming weeks with more residents on the hot seat. Thank you and keep uh, giving your feedback and suggestions for the Kaksha experience to improve. Do subscribe on the ROS online channel on YouTube. All previous Kaksha, including this one, uh, are uploaded there. And good night from Team ROS. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you sir.